Lisa here welcome back to my channel and welcome to my weekly deck reviews oh my gosh it feels like a hot minute since I filmed a video I think this is the longest gap I've ever gone not actively filming like almost every day so it's felt like a long a long time I still have a bit of a cough but I'm just bleeding off the rest of it so I'm hoping I can get by with little sips of my beverage we'll see how I do but I really want to talk about what I've been working with and what I'm going to be working with and all of that good stuff. So let's dive right into it. So for the past week, I have been working with my Forest of Enchantment Tarot. I keep forgetting the name of it because the guidebook says um, your path through the Enchanted Forest. And so I keep wanting to call it the Enchanted Forest Tarot. Kind of like what this happened also with um, the fairy deck, the Hidden Realm. I kept wanting to call it Journey to the Hidden Realm Tarot, but that was the name of the book. The deck was called Tarot of the Hidden Realm. It gets confusing, especially because I'm not holding the box. But um, I have been carrying around the cards themselves in one of Peggy's um, wrap bags. It's one of her prototype designs because it held both the Oracle deck I was working with this week and the Tarot deck. So I'm going to talk about um, the Forest of Enchantment Tarot first. <sighs> Oh my gosh, you guys, this deck is incredible to work with. I'm going to be, after I film this video, um, edging this deck. I think I'm going to be edging it in blues and greens to match the backs. I fell really hard for this deck this week, so I worked with it a ton. Um, I worked with all of the guidebook. I worked with the cards for readings for myself, for readings for others. I worked with the deck for daily draws for um, spreads when I had questions. I just, I wanted more and more reasons to play with it. It had so many wonderfully deep messages. The artwork is so rich and it just, it pulls you in and it's so, I love this Page of Cups, Child Divisions. Now one of the things I want to talk about is that there are some changes to the wordings um, in this deck. So instead of cups, wands, swords, and pentacles, we have visions for the cups. <clears throat> I'm not going to cough. <laughs> I'm going to cough. We have visions for the cups. We have boons for the pentacles, challenges for the swords, and spells for the wands. Oh, hello to my stalker card. Um, this card was came up a lot for me this week. But those changes... I feel like just helped me to be immersed in the world of this deck and they did not feel like they interrupted the way that I read the tarot in any way shape or form. I feel like visions make sense for the cups because it's all about how we perceive the world. We, we perceive the world through the filter of our feelings and our emotions and I feel like that's what visions represents and so for the cup suit that really really works for me. When we're talking about boons for pentacles you know, this just makes me happy, and I'll tell you why. Because in a lot of the pagan circles that I have been in throughout my life, um, what, some of the most memorable were, um, and I wish I could remember which one, but there was one with a group I used to circle with, and at, uh, at a particular Sabbath, and I'm terrible at telling this story, we would pass around a drinking horn, and each person would share something about themselves and would ask a boon of somebody else. And I'm again, I'm telling this, I'm getting this all mixed up because my memory is terrible. And I don't even remember the exact phrase that we would use, but I think it was like, but first I ask a boon or something along those lines. And so a boon was like a favor, a request. It was some sort of energetic exchange. And so the boon represented something you got back f for this particular energetic exchange. I don't know how else to describe it. And I think that's really special for pentacles because we think of pentacles a lot of times as money. And money is one form of resource that we have available to us, but a boon is any kind of resource. It can be a tangible resource, financial, um, uh, or or physical, like a gift, right? Or it could also be non-tangible, time spent with a loved one, or a reading you get from somebody. There's there's, there's things you can give and get that are not tangible, and boons kind of encompass all of it. And I know that that particular word caused some confusion for people, but that's my understanding of what a boon is. Um, it's like a favor. It's like, a, it's like something you're giving somebody, and it doesn't have to be physical. So I love that for the pentacles. 
when we're talking about the swords, I actually really like the word challenges. I think, I think it's easy to think of challenges as a negative thing, and the sword suit often gets a bad rap for showing a lot of difficult and negative cards. But <clears throat> I think challenge can be an opportunity. I think challenges can be positive or negative. I do think of it more as a neutral word. It's like there are things that interrupt your path that you need to address. They can be good, they can be bad, they can be neutral. Um, but I freaking loved this Two of Challenges or Two of Swords card, which talks about really how you have to confront yourself when you're making a decision. You have to face your own stuff and you have to be accountable to yourself. And I thought that was so powerful. And there were a lot of cards like that in this deck. When we talk about spells for wands, that again just works for me. I mean, wands represent creativity, their manifestation, the work that we put out into the world. And what are spells if not our intents? intent, <laughs> pluralized, but what are spells if not our intent and our hopes and our dreams and our manifestations and wands and spells, they just, it works for me. So I really, 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 really enjoyed that. I love the Council of Animals as judgment. And there's a beautiful reading uh, spread in the book that has you basically meet with the Council of Animals and answer or be accountable for who you are, what you're into, you know, what your prey is, what your your hopes are. It's just, it's really cool. Um, I love this Seven of Spells, which speaks to the lack of diversity in the gnomes and their lack of trust in things that are unfamiliar to them. And this dragon is left having to defend itself against this sort of angry mob. I mean, there's just... All the images here are powerful. I freaking love the aces. Here's an here's an example. I'm trying so hard not to cough. The the images are visually very 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 rich and very detailed. Let's see if I can have another sip. I'm probably gonna have to have another cough break in a second. I just really love this deck, you guys. I mean, there's not a single card I had beef with. Of course, I love the two of visions, the two of cups, with these two females having met each other. Oh, there's just so much good stuff. I love the imagery in the Seven of Swords, or Seven of Challenges, with our foxy friends here. And the Major Arcana is wonderful. Um, the court cards have been renamed, so you have Weavers are the Queens. Seekers are the Knights. Let's see if I can find you an example of a Seeker. Okay, well, there's another Weaver. Come on. Oh my gosh, there's going to be no seeker. Seriously? This always happens when I'm filming. I suppose I could have planned ahead. I'm very sorry. Well, okay, we'll get back to the seeker. Keepers are the kings. Child for the page, or children are the pages. I just really... Why am I finding no seekers? This is cracking me up. Here we go. Here is the seeker of boons, so the knight of pentacles. Really beautiful. This deck is really beautiful. I could stare at it all day long. Um, this is a favorite for sure, and there's so much here, so much rich, richness, so much depth. This would be great for a beginner because the, the images are so beautifully aligned with the meanings. There's a couple here that are a little trickier. Um, the Ten of Wands or the Ten of Spells is not somebody with a heavy bundle, but it shows these girls who have been, they had been captured in the fairy world and they had been dancing and dancing and dancing and couldn't get out, so they're exhausted. Um, so the meaning is there, but you do need to spend a little time with the guidebook to get that one. Um, there's a lot of beef with the fish. This is a salmon for the Keeper of, of um, Vas uh, Visions, which is the Cups suit. But I get this because the salmon of knowledge and wisdom, it makes sense to me from my studies of Caradwen and the Cauldron and it just, that, that particular reference does make sense to me, but it is a little bit disjointed with all the other quartz being humanoid. There's a couple other tricky ones in here. The Eight of Cups was a little tricky until I read the book. Um, because it features some like wraith-like figures who are sort of trapped. I was going to try and find it, but we know how that's working out today. But there, there are a couple that are a little bit trickier, but for the most part, this is really, really immersive. The world just pulls you right in. I just, 
Look at this 10 of challenges or 10 of swords. Again, we don't see somebody stabbed by 10 swords, but we do see somebody who's, you know, we're weary and worn out and has been defeated. And the backs are beautiful. I just, I really love this deck. If you do not have this deck, I mean, and it's a mass market deck, you can get it for a reasonable price. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure this one will stay in print for a nice long time. Let's talk about cardstock because there was a little bit of buzz about the cardstock. I loved it. I love this cardstock. It's thin ish, but it's actually not so thin. Like, I have definitely handled much thinner decks than this, so I don't think it's that it's very thin. It has a bit of a gloss, but not too much. I would say it's kind of like um, a little bit more than satin, but not as glossy as some of the other Llewellyn decks that have come out recently. My Borderless Mystic Fairy deck is much glossier than this. My Borderless um, Tarot of the Hidden Realm, I had to think about the name again, that one is glossier than this. So it's kind of got a, a semi-matte. It does hold a wee bit of a bow if you rifle shuffle it like I do, but it rifle shuffles just beautifully. Let me just show you my bridge here. So it's really quite nice. Um, and I love shuffling it, I loved handling it. It's flexible, it's easy to handle. Like I've got no complaints. This is this is gonna hold up, I think, very, very nicely. Now that being said, I'm pretty rough with my cards, and I have already, I think, chipped one of them just ever so slightly, but I'm gonna be edging these cards anyway. And as cards get a little bit worn, edging them just brings them new life. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that process, actually. I am um, going to be getting a Peggy bag made for this, but Peggy's been a little bit backed up in her sewing room lately, so my projects are a little bit behind. But I um, have the fabric picked out, and I will be getting a bag made for this in a small, so like the same size as like this bag. But for now, I have to keep this bag somewhere else just so that it's safe and protected while I am waiting for my Peggy bag for it. So it's going in the like honey-do list, basically, is what's happening with that. But I'm really excited to, to put that one away, even though I had so much fun with it because I'm going to be diving into some really interesting stuff. So let's talk about the book really briefly. I've been talking a long time. Oh boy. This book is beautiful. It is arranged numerologically, so it goes majors and then it goes aces all the way through to the courts. I did, I read every single page of this book. Um, there's some journaling pages in the back and like several journaling pages in the back. And there is some really interesting spreads in here. I'd like to share my favorite. I did all of them because I just love playing with this deck. But my favorite was actually a method, more than a spread I would say, called Breadcrumbs and Moonstones, inspired by the Hansel and Gretel story. So in Hansel and Gretel, um, Hansel drops bread or drops moonstones and they work to help them get back home because they reflect the moonlight. But when they get taken out to the forest the second time and left by their parents or left by their father, he doesn't have any moonstones so he uses breadcrumbs. But of course, by nighttime, they had been eaten up by the birds and they had no path back. So the breadcrumbs and moonstones spread or method is where you concentrate on your question and then you deal out the deck into two piles. The first pile is your moonstones pile. So this is what you should do. And the second pile is your breadcrumbs, but you divide the entire deck into these two piles. And then you flip over two cards from the top of one from the top of each pile and you have what should you do, what shouldn't you do. And then you do another two and then you do another two. And they, you can go as long as you want until you feel very clear about the answer to your question, but they recommend at least three breadcrumbs. I used that multiple times this week and it was such a cool method that is definitely going to be sticking with me. I really, really thought it was useful. I liked the way that pulling two cards, interpreting those, and then pulling two more to further clarify and then two more until you felt really solid. It just really, really worked for me. And I thought that was really unique and cool because a lot of times in these guidebooks we get kind of, I shouldn't say predictable, but we definitely get basic spreads. We don't see a lot of really unique twists in mass market decks especially. And that really surprised me. And there's some other really cool stuff in that book about that but it's also not unwieldy. It's very easy to read. It's not overly text heavy, like you get about a page on every card, but sometimes even less. And it's very, it's very spot on. And all of these closer look sections, okay, I could just talk about this forever apparently. <laughs> I need to do a detailed walkthrough of this deck, but until then, just so you know, I loved it. I loved it. And it is definitely a fast favorite in my collection. Let's move on to the Oracle deck I was working with this week. So this week, I have been working with the Pathfinder deck. 
by Skull Garden, Andrew Swartz. Um, I never used the yes no coin this week, but it's cool that it's in there. I'm just leaving it in there. Actually, you know what? I think I'm gonna take this out and put it on my altar because I'm more likely to use it if it's not with this deck. But I will say this was fun for me to use. I didn't love the shape for shuffling. I found this deck annoying to shuffle because when I take it in half and I shuffle it, I mean like it's a nice smooth matte cardstock, but it just it's just not long enough and I keep I keep feeling like I'm gonna bend them and I've they kind of get bowed a little bit when I do that and I like to rifle shuffle and maybe I'm just spoiled. But what I did tend to do with this deck is I would take, I think I showed this last week, but I would just swirl the cards like this because there's a directional quality to this deck. So I would just kind of twist it in my hands to get them all twisted up and then I would straighten them out and I would probably rifle. I rifled a lot even though I shouldn't rifle this deck because um, it rifles poorly. But then I would just hand over hand and I would decide which corner was going to be up and I would focus on my question as I hand over hand. And I typically took the corner that was in closest to my hand away from my body, so that one. And then I would flip a card, and whatever side was up would be the side that I would read in the guidebook. Now it's a little confusing in the guidebook, and I'll tell you why. On the cards, it's pretty clear to me that this is like a full moon. This is like a new moon, or a dark moon at the bottom. And then we have a sort of waxing and waning sort of feel here okay so it's really obvious to me that this is positive this is negative this is active and this is passive but when you go to the book because it's a black and white book and the, on these they're using white to denote the solid parts and clear to denote the not solid parts right but in the black and white guidebook black is the solid and then you have a hollow circle so black the black circle here is the positive so the black solid circle is the same as the white solid circle, and that may seem obvious or it may seem really confusing, but I found it kind of confusing when I first looked at it. Um, so the way that you see it on the card is correct. The black equals the white circle, <laughs> and then the hollow circle at the bottom is still hollow in the book. It's just outlined in black. So what I would do is whatever side was up, I think, how did I draw this? I think I drew it, well, regardless. <laughs> whatever side was up, that was what I would read in the guidebook. So if it had the hollow circle, it was passive, I believe. And yeah, hollow circle is passive and solid little circle is active. So um, I would read that and then I would concentrate on that meaning. Some of these cards felt very straightforward in what their meaning would be about and some didn't. Like I got the like spaceship or alien card this week. And let me just read you what it said, because it kind of threw me for a loop. I was like, what? It's not must not be called alien. It must be called spaceship. Oh, no, it's not called spaceship either. Oh, UFO? I'm so organized today. Yeah, UFO. Positive. An unexpected visitor is on the way. Okay, it makes sense, but it's not what I would have thought it meant. Um, negative. Existence as you know it is over. Resistance is futile. Active. Take a picture because no one is going to believe this. And passive. I want to believe. And I don't know. There was something about that one that I was like, hmm. But I will say it read better than I thought it would, which sounds really bad. I don't mean it bad. But I was a little bit confused because there's no keywords on the cards themselves. So, yeah, some of them just feel really obvious with what their meaning might be, and some of them feel a little trickier. So I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence about this one. I think that if I were, if I were to decide to buy this again right now based on my experience with it this week, I don't know that I would, to be completely honest. I love the artwork. I love what he does. I love the Earthbound Oracle, and I think this one just doesn't quite do it for me. I, I'm going to spend some more time with it, like it's not leaving my collection anytime soon, because I really want to spend some time getting to know it, but it didn't blow me away in any particular way, and I just didn't feel like we got along very well this week, but it was fine. Like, it was in that meh category for me. So that's my thoughts on the Pathfinder Oracle deck. Now, also in December, because I'm going to be wrap, wrapping up December with this video too, I've been working with all month the Fairy Tale Lenormand by Lisa Hunt and Arwen Lynch. Um, this deck is really sweet. I really enjoyed using this. I changed up my practice 
Um, I, I believe the first couple weeks of the month I was pulling um, a three card spread every day and then I switched out to just doing a three card spread for the week ahead. I really enjoyed working with this deck. It was fun to look at. I really appreciated the artwork. I really appreciate Lisa Hunt's artwork in general and the book was kind of fun to read the little snippets on every single card. It's not my favorite Lenormand deck ever because I do find it a little bit busy for what I like in a Lenormand deck. I like my Lenormand decks to be pretty clear and straightforward. So I don't know. I'm happy I own it. I love Lisa Hunt's artwork. I love the way that the backs of this are the keyholes and the fairy tale tarot that I have by Lisa Hunt has the key that sort of goes with this backing. So that's a super fun little thing. But yeah, definitely not my very favorite, but I'm super glad I own it and it read fine for me this week. It was fun. I do think sometimes the busyness of the artwork is a little distracting for a Lenormand deck, but in a tarot deck, this kind of artwork is fantastic. So you never really know until you work with it how you're going to get on with it, right? Which is why I do these weekly videos, but had fun with it. I'm kind of okay with putting it away for a bit. As always, my runes are wonderful. I don't feel the need to have a bazillion rune sets. I say that now. I mean, I'll let you know if that ever changes. But for now, I feel good with what I've got. Let's talk about what I'm going to be working with this week. Oh, and my reading cloth. I'm finally going to be putting away my colorful swirls. I used the purple side behind all of my pictures this past week. Um, and I'm going to be switching up to something different for next week. I love this. This is such a cozy, like, cuddly <laughs> reading cloth. Every reading cloth can be cuddly. It's very plush. I love it. It's one of my favorites. But it's time for something a little bit less bright. Because I am going to be working with, oh boy, <laughs> The Alchemical Tarot by Robert M. Place. Now I picked up this fourth edition several months ago and I have been setting it aside specifically planning for January. <laughs> and I'll explain why. This is what the backings look like. My deck is still very much in order. It is a beautiful deck. Sorry for the glare there. There's a ton of alchemical symbolism throughout the entire deck. You also get two lover's cards. There's a slightly more naughty one and a more chaste one to choose from. This deck is absolutely breathtaking to look at. I'm really intrigued by alch alchemy. I have been for a while now, ever since I started watching Discovery of Witches, actually. And that interest was only heightened by my work with the um, Wild Messengers Alchemical Tarot deck, which is an animal-based tarot deck that is based in alchemical understanding. And that really piqued my interest because there was a whole section in that very beefy guidebook about alchemy and the alchemical process, and I really enjoyed working with that. Um, so this is sort of taking it to the next level. The reason that I planned to not work with this deck until January, however, is because I need an entire month to work with this deck, I feel like, because I really want to read, we'll see how I do, but I really want to read the book that Robert M. Place wrote, which is The Tarot, Magic, Alchemy, Hermeticism, and Neoplatonism, second edition, with a guide to the Waitsmith Tarot, the Alchemical Tarot, and the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery. Holy moly, this book is gigantic. It also weighs a ton, but it's that kind of magazine quality, really nice paper. Um, this book has a decent sized print, so it's not, qu well, it looks so much smaller on screen, but it, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's a ton of um, information in here, but the actual text of the, let me see if I can explain this properly. The part of the book before you get into the detailed information on every single card uh, is about 365 pages before you get, so this chunk of the book is sort of like the book with the sort of general information and then as soon as you turn to page 366 you're on to the Fool card and you have the Rider Waite Smith, the Marseille, and then you have the Alchemical Tarot and the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery both um, pictured in the bottom half here. So it's a comparison of all those decks. So my goal is to read this book in January. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Um, but at the very least, I'm going to be using this as the guidebook alongside the deck. And I'm going to be working with this primarily to keep things simple for myself. 
I am working with a fairly simple um, oracle deck beside it and mostly just to help anchor my readings every day. So I'm going to be working with the Carolyn Miss archetype cards. I have these deck cards on my wish list for ages and I finally arranged a trade for them earlier this year. I um, I plan to just use these straight up. Like I'm going to shuffle them. I will draw one card um, each day to sort of anchor my reading and I'll work with that archetype. I'll see how that archetype maybe plays into my day, that sort of thing. That's how I'm thinking I'm gonna use these. I don't know ultimately if that's how they're gonna continue to be used in my collection. And I may change these out week, like my Oracle deck out week by week as I work with Robert M. Place's deck. We will see. Um, but this is what's going to travel with me for like daily draws and that sort of thing. Here's where I'm a little bit torn. So. For my Lenormand deck for January, I would really like to work with the Burning Serpent Oracle. This is also by Robert M. Place, and this one is also, um, this was a collaboration with Rachel Pollock. <sighs> okay, like I feel like I really need to work with this this month since I'm going to be working with the Alchemical Tarot, but this is like a Lenormand deck that's been sort of beefed up a bit. So it looks like a pretty classical Lenormand, but there's a layer of sort of, um, I think alchemical or hermetic symbology on top of it. So it's got its own pretty beefy book and I'm just really not sure. I'm not sure if I'm going to get through it all. You know what I mean? So I, but I may use this as just a regular, um, Lenormand deck for my week ahead, even if I can't get into the guidebook yet. And depending on how I feel about it, then at the end of the month, if I'm finished the other big beefy book, then I may dive into the, the book for this as well. But it looks like it can be used as just a straight up Lenormand. Um, and you don't really have to dive into, I don't think you have to, yeah. It's got the regular classic 36 cards, and then it's got an extra man and woman, but they're an Isis and Osiris card. So we'll see. But I'm excited to learn more about this deck. It does come with a, um, the actual deck itself does come with like a little white book, like a little pamphlet style. And then um, the book was sold separately. So it says a Lenormand of the soul. I'm just super intrigued by it. So I may refer to the book when I do my week, week ahead polls. I don't know how this is going to look yet. I will keep you guys posted. But that is what I'm going to be working with in January. At that and I will probably still be working with my runes but I'm not 100% sure I may take a break from them since this is all so very rich um, and the reading cloth I'm going to be using is this one with some beautiful fish all over and on one side some ocean waves on the other but I think these might serve as the background most of the time they're just really really beautiful and they've got these like gold metallic accent so so pretty so that's what I'm going to be working with wish me luck with this ginormous monstrosity but because I'm working with just this deck all month long, I don't know what my weekly deck reviews is going to look like for the rest of, or for all of January. So I probably will keep you guys posted in other videos or do one big recap at the end of the month, or I might do multiple and check-ins. I'm not really sure yet. I'm feeling this out as I go along. But in any case, I hope you all have a really, really wonderful new year. Happy new year ahead of time because this is going up before the new year. Yes. And I will see you all again very, very soon. Bye.